this. Hey, everybody. Happy Good Friday and Easter weekend. Sean Murphy with 1455. Another uh, installment of the 1455 interview, which I could not be having more fun with in part because it gives me the opportunity to talk to interesting authors and on very special occasions, uh, friends that I admire. And today is exhibit A. Um, I've been looking forward to this really since the series started. Uh, as you'll see from the unforced enthusiasm and admiration that I have for this young man, uh, I have known this fellow for decades, uh, which is not to age either of us, but suffice it to say, and I was going to kick it off by facetiously saying the ridiculous cliche, those who can't do teach <laughs> is a cliche, but I can say whoever said that was either a talentless or very jealous hack because the fella I'm about to introduce, I've been able to see do both at the highest levels. So Chuck Cascio obliterates the notion that one can either teach or do because he's been doing both for a very long time. And it's been my extraordinary pleasure to benefit from his tutelage. Uh, and I do consider him a role model. So I'm going to read a condensed version of his bio because his bio is very impressive uh, and not short because he's done a lot. I will put the full bio in the write-up when this is done so you can really appreciate the scope uh, of his accomplishments. But briefish bio. Chuck Cascio is an award-winning journalist, educator, short story writer, and business leader. Author of three nonfiction books, Chuck has had hundreds of news stories, feature articles, and opinion pieces published in a wide range of newspapers, magazines, and journals. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Chuck moved to the DC area at an early age, but remains a New Yorker at heart. He and his wonderful wife, Faye, who herself is an award-winning science educator, are dedicated gym rats who live in Reston, Virginia, near Washington, DC. And Chuck now focuses on writing fiction. He also posts blogs on various topics, and I heartily recommend his trio of books, The Fire Escape Stories, Volumes 1 and 2, and the novel, the Fire Escape Belongs in Brooklyn, based loosely on some of these Brooklyn experiences as a young man in the Big Apple. Amazing reads, I'll put links to those as well. Chuck can be reached at chuckwrites at yahoo.com and I will put a link to his website as well so you can check him out. Mr. Cascio, thank you for being here today. It is a real honor. And as I joked before we came on, I'm used to being a student, so I kind of feel like the teacher. Thanks for giving me this rare opportunity. Listen, it's my pleasure, Sean. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. And I, I, I hope that I get a good grade on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know where I live. So I certainly uh, am going to be inclined to judge on a curve, although I suspect that that won't be necessary. And in fact, because I'll probably forget to say this at the end, I'm just going to blow your ego up at the, at the start. I should have mentioned this. I had this in my notes. In all seriousness, folks, uh, I, I genuinely credit Chuck uh, was uh, uh, the faculty advisor basically ran the school newspaper that we did back in the 80s. I learned everything about journalism from him, including you never have an excuse to spell someone's name wrong in a story. So young youngsters out there, listen to Chuck. Uh, but as a teacher, I, I can't tell you the number of peers and then younger people I've seen come through the ranks that worship at the altar. So it really is special to have the opportunity to hear an educator who is instilled the love of language and the discipline of form into so many people answering questions about what motivates him. So with that said, Chuck, what's the first book that made you want to be a writer or a book that changed your life at a former formative age? Um, I can still remember distinctly uh, the early 1950s, my parents and um, my aunts and uncles sitting around talking about this book called The Catcher in the Rye. And I was at that point, maybe six or seven years old, something like that. And um, I, they were talking so emotionally about it that I thought, hell, I ought to try to sneak a look at that. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I actually snuck into my parents' bedroom. We were living in an apartment at the time. And I you know, read a little bit of it. I didn't want to get caught. So I put it aside. And every once in a while, I would sneak looks at it. But it just, even as a little kid, it, it stuck in my head. 
And uh, then, you know, jump ahead a couple of years uh, later when I was a little bit older, maybe 11 or 12, you know, I just, then I could openly say to my parents, I want to read this book. And they were happy, good, go read it. But that, that story really, um, you know, J.D. Salinger's story and the way he told it made me look at, you know, reading and writing differently. I mean, I had always been inclined that way. <clears throat> he even used to write picture books and stuff for my parents when I was about five or six years old. But, you know, I just, I never knew that it could sound like that. Yeah. So I put Catcher, you know, Catcher up there. And then as I got a little bit older, you know, I, you know, every time I read it or when I taught it, um, I always sort of found something additional in The Catcher in the Rye. I can say the same thing about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. And one of the big things that came out of those books for me when I was teaching them is to see the way the students reacted because they would teach me stuff, you know, because the way the books hit them and the way they would respond either orally or in writing uh, really made me look at it and go, wow, this book, these books are even more wonderful than I thought. But yeah. I put that Catcher and To Kill a Mockingbird right up there. That's a good one-two punch. Um, and, and you won't be surprised, not, not the first time either of those books have been brought up in the series. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sure about that. Yeah. All right. Uh, impossible but fun question. If you had to say, who is your most profound artistic influence? This is a really difficult one for me, um, Sean. Um, again, the household that I grew up in was filled with uh, artistic influence. My parents weren't, they weren't doing it because they said, oh, wait, want our kids to be artists. They just loved it. And every Sunday was opera day. So we would have opera flowing through the, the house. And, you know, um, I remember distinctly one time a Shakespeare production was on TV and my parents had the complete works of Shakespeare. And so my dad had the book and he had, uh, he and my mom and the, the three of us, my, I'm the oldest of, th of three. And um, we watched the production and I forget which, which play it was. But he would then read passages that were coming up and say to us, okay, listen, here's what's coming next. And he would read just a couple of lines. And, you know, it, those kinds of things. So for me to say, you know, a profound artist influence is very, very difficult because there were so many. Um, everything from, you know, um, Shakespeare uh, to opera to jazz. My dad was a huge jazz fan. Uh, I was fortunate as a teenager to work in my cousin's nightclub in DC and I, I called the shadows and at the shadows, I worked the lights for people like Dave Brubeck or, um, you know, Astro Gilberto, um, you know, so all of that is, is the influence for me. Um, but, you know, I also love, you know, individual people. So if I'm going to pick, pick particular writers, certainly Salinger, Twain, Dickinson, Wallace Stegner, okay, who's one that I'll probably say more about later, and then more current, somewhat, Tim O'Brien, who wrote The Things They Carried in Going After Cacciato. Oh, what, a, what, what brilliant, brilliant work that influenced me more, you know, as an adult. Um, and then if jo Joyce Carol Oates, Oates, if I want to go into music, I'll talk about Springsteen, Dylan. I want to talk about art, I'll talk about Hopper. So, you know, I, I just have a hard time singling someone out. Right. And I think that's the whole point, right? And, and the, not, there's nothing that, that uh, those artistically inclined or passionate about the arts love talking about and debating more. And I think nothing that people that aren't like listening to less, but that's what yeah. separates us from the uh, Philistines. So, so be it. So be it, right. All right, so you sort of led up to the next question because I have my own I have my own prediction of what this answer might be, and I'll I'll tell you if I was right or not. But you're welcome to list either or both, but an album or movie that you recommend without reservation. I don't think that. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think that you'll guess this movie. Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if you will. Should I say it first, or do you want to tell me what your guess is? I had a guess for the album, but I didn't think about movie. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for the album then. Okay. For the movie, there's a movie that was out, oh, I think it was early two, 2002, something like that, Lost in Translation, Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I talk about this when I do 
you know, various lectures and, you know, artistic things. And a lot of people are like, what? You know, they haven't, they haven't heard of it or they didn't see it. Right. But this movie is so brilliant in the way that it captures humanity and relationships and so forth. Okay. Plus it has an ending, which I won't give away, that I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think that the, the way that the whole story um, pulls things together is um, wonderful. Plus, when I first heard about the movie, I was curious because the title Lost in Translation comes from a Robert Frost uh, quote. Poetry is what is lost in translation. That was something that Frost said. I think it was Frost. Okay, could be wrong. Check me on that, Sean. Yeah. Okay. the teacher. I've heard the quote, but I, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't put money on that, but I, I think that that sounds right to me. All right. And so then I was really curious about the movie and the movie just is really outstanding in that it met those expectations. Other movies, Deer Hunter, and then Saving Private Ryan for so many reasons, but there's a knife scene in it where Adam Goldberg, you know, is involved. Uh, again, I don't want to give it away, yeah. but it's so painful to watch and so powerful. And it makes you realize what goes on in those most intimate, difficult moments of war. And we go to albums. All right. So what are you going to say? Well, so in fairness, I, now, I'm, now I'm second guessing because I, I, I forgot about the Dylan uh, influence. I, I went right to Springsteen. And then I didn't want to outthink myself. I went back and forth between Darkness on the Edge of Town and Born to Run. If gun to head, I would say Born to Run would be the one that you would drop. And I would say you have scored an A because Born, no, you say you would drop Born to Run? I'm saying I would, I would, that's what I would pick. That's true. Okay, here, got it. Okay. <laughs> you would, you've scored an A plus. Uh, Born to Run is one of them. And, um, you know, you were also right in, in Dylan. Uh, Times They Are, are a Changing was, uh, I thought, just a monumental album. Born to Run, brilliant album. I believe it's, um, you can take the Dylan songs and many Springsteen songs and just separate them out as poetry. Okay, I mean, that's really, really what they are. But you know, Sean, I'm also captivated and always have been by um, lesser known um, artists and singers, writers, artists, uh, singers. Um, there's a woman by the name of Iris Dement. Are you familiar with Iris? Sweet is the Melody. There you go, thank you, exactly right. And there's an album called My Life and I, I listened to that and, you know, one of the things literature, music, art should be able to transport you, you know, and when I listen to Iris DeMint, I mean, I'm a guy from Brooklyn, but when I listen to Iris, I'm a totally different person. I'm sitting out there in the middle of Nebraska or something yeah. and just loving life because she makes it that way. Um, so, you know, those are, those are a few of the, um, you know, the few of them. And I, you know, I just, there's so many lesser known artists out there um, that, that I just, you know, I try to convince my brother uh, to someday, he's a TV producer, as you probably know. Yeah. And I talk to him occasionally about, why don't we do a, why don't we do a TV documentary about all of these lesser known artists, musicians that are out there, you know, that nobody knows about, but that are playing in places like Jam and Java over here in Vienna, yeah. okay, and small venues that are just absolutely brilliant yeah. so maybe it'll happen yeah i look forward to that and, and and we also were talking before we came on about you know kind of emerging at slowly but steadily from covid and by gosh being able to appreciate live art uh especially music i think it just has been a a global catastrophe uh for our souls that we haven't been able to experience that because you can't approximate it but also these artists uh, haven't been able to make the living that they deserve to make. So something to celebrate for sure, but Absolutely. I'm with you, man. Uh, local, good local art and, and uh, shining light on the less known artists. But like I said, the reason I went to Springsteen is because I, I have the benefit of knowing you yes. and know a thing or two, but, but it was still a guess. So I'm glad I was, uh, I, I was my, my compass was uh, needles on point. And just to show you quickly how teachers can learn, it was my students who turned me on to Springsteen back in 1974, 75. Okay, because they knew I was a big Dylan fan. And they said, you know, you really need to listen to this guy, Bruce Springsteen. I go, come on, nobody's like Bob Dylan. <laughs> and then they played. Um, so after school one day, they made me sit down and listen to um, Fourth of July Asbury Park. 
And I was like, what? <laughs> and that, that hooked me, and I've been a big, big Bruce fan ever since. If I'm not mistaken, Chuck, uh, you wrote about that on your blog. I so did. I'll make sure to point that out in the write-up after this, too. You, you wrote about your students turning you on to uh, early Springsteen. So Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. Right on. All right. Uh, another impossible, but I think for a teacher-writer, a fun one. There's a million options, but if you had to pick the best first or last line of any book ever, what would you go to? Well, um, for a for a um, last line, I mean, Gatsby's hard to beat, right? Yeah. Okay. So we beat on, you know, boats against the current drawn back ceaselessly into the past. I don't know if I quoted it exactly right. But there's another um, last line that I actually wanted to read because this is from Wallace Stegner in the book, Angle of Repose. Mm. And just, just, I don't know if you know, but your friend, Mark, my son, uh, when he was um, a kid, I always found him going to the back of a book first. He always read the last line of a book first, and then he would start reading it. Because I said, why do you do that? It's because I want to see if the book is going to, you know, if it's going to line up and, and, and logically get to where, where it ends. Pretty smart. Very but, smart. But this is, so here's just, uh, this is a teaser, because this is the last line of Angle of Repose, one of my favorite books of all time. Here's how it ends. In this not quite quiet darkness, while the diesel breaks its heart more and more faintly on the mountain grade, I lie wondering if I am man enough to be a bigger man than my grandfather. So to me, okay, now you gotta read the whole book probably to really appreciate that line, yeah. but it's just, it's just plain brilliant. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy Chuck because I, I have read that book and I enjoyed it, it's been a while. So A, I should revisit that. But B, that's the first time Mr. Stegner's come up in the series. So I'm delighted that, uh, case in point, Gatsby's come up myriad times, including that was my choice when I took the, the quiz. Um, but Stegner hasn't come up and, and he deserves to. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm happy to, happy to raise the awareness of Wallace Stegner to anybody that uh, is listening. Excellent. All right, how about who you consider the most underrated author, or if that's too difficult, an underrated author that you'd love to give a shout out to? Well, I'm gonna stick with Mr. Stegner. Okay, listen, I've talked about him many, many places, and um, I can't say enough about him. Now, he did gain certain accolades, you know, in his career, but he didn't reach the level, you know, of, of some. And, you know, he, he deserves to. Yeah. Um, I think part of the reason that he didn't reach that level is that he writes about a section of the country that is very different from where a lot of the major publishing went on and so forth. And, you know, that's not to say that, for example, the only reason Hemingway was successful was because of a New York agent and publisher by any means. But, but Stegner, the beauty of his, of his writing you know, when you read Wallace Stegner, you know that there's a man who just sat down there and said, I am going to get this right. And so I strongly urge people, you know, to read my, my favorite one, you know, Angle of, of Repose. But Crossing to Safety is another one. And um, either of those two books, you know, I think are really monumental and get and, it, and deserve even more credit than they, than they get. Listen, listen to the teacher, folks. <laughs> That's all I need to say about that. All right. I know the answer to this one, but God, I love asking this question. <laughs> Why have you not read Moby Dick? Or if you have, is there a classic that you haven't gotten around to yet uh, that you mean to get around to? So you, you know the answer to this. Well, I mean, I'll just uh, I know you've read Moby Dick. There's no there's no way you haven't read Moby Dick. You probably, right. you, you taught Moby Dick, if I'm not mistaken. I did it at one point, yes. So good, you're absolutely right. I, I read Moby Dick. I liked Moby Dick. I thought it was, you know, well done. But I thought your question is an intriguing one. And there's a book that I really need to read, and that's Anna Karenina. Believe it or not, no, it's not that hard to believe, I guess. I haven't read it. Now it's 800 pages or so. But, you know, I, I've read pieces of it. I've read so much about it. It was, you know, like when, when John Steinbeck says this is his favorite book of all time, you probably ought to pay attention. 
um, you know, I got to visit the Russia a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, I, boy, did I just absorbed, you know, just being there for a couple of days, you know, the, the massive history, you know, in, in St. Petersburg. And so, you know, I, I just, I really need to get around to reading Anna Karenina. And um, I, I would um, like to, you know, dig into that. And probably as a result of talking about it with you, I'm going to do it. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll throw my two cents and say, I heartily recommend um, doing so. I, I had read it as an undergrad and I, and I liked it a lot. But when I was in grad school, I had the, the experience uh, forced upon me because I was an idiot and did grad school in a year. So I was taking four classes at a time, but wow. uh, I had to read that in two weeks and I did, but that, I don't even know if it's possible these days because it was an analog era. You, you could just take the phone off the hook and absorb yourself. But that's one of my fondest memories, having the opportunity to luxuriate in that prose kind of monomaniacally for eight hour stretches. Um, I wouldn't suggest anyone has the ability to do that now, but that's the kind of book you really can get lost in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, it's been a while since I read it, but I, mean, I was a big Dostoevsky fan. And I, I suspect just thinking back, I, I wonder an older man reading that might, it might, there might be passages that are a little overdone. I think Tolstoy ages well. I think mature readers can read Tolstoy and appreciate the majesty of his craft. Speaking of someone that wanted to get it right, um, your, your comment about Stegner, I think, yeah. applies. Tolstoy was a tactician uh, in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's monumental work. Great. All right. Great. So there'll be, I'll give you four months and then there'll be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, four months. That's only 200 pages a month. I should be able to do that. <laughs> All right. I, I kind of know this one too, but I'd love you to expound for, the, uh, for those that haven't yet discovered your work. Is there a single theme or issue or topic that your work seeks to address or seems to address? Well, I, you know, I, I write what I write. So it's, you know, it's sort of, it, it, it sort of manifests itself, but I do look at the core of what I've written, short stories, as well as the three uh, fiction works over the past few years. And um, I can see that there's something that I'm trying to say. One of the big things is coming of age. I think it's so important as people go through life that they recognize where they were, how they came to be what they are. I just think that's really important. And I don't sit down saying, I'm gonna write this so I can show people. No, I don't do that. I really don't. But I, I recognize in what I've written uh, that coming of age is really key. <clears throat> there's also within my own writing, there's a, um, a subtle, I try, and this I do try to incorporate, subtle influence of the direction of where the, where the work is going. I want to give people, I want people when they're finished to be able to go, wait a second, how did we get here? Did this, you know, how did this line up? And then if they think about particular passages and particular pieces of it, they'll go, oh my God, that's exactly what we were getting at. The other thing is that I think that there's a, um, in, 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 my, in my own experience, both in my own writing and in reading of other people, there is a um, impact that random artists can have on readers. That, um, you know, you pick up a book by somebody you never heard of and all of a sudden you go, whoa, you know, that really, that really hit me. And I think my work can do that. I'm not that well known as a writer. Okay, but I think from what I've heard from people and the readings that I've done and the reviews that I'm getting and places that I get invited to, people go, you know what? That, that really made me think about, and then they go into their own lives. And Sean, I love that. I love that it transports them into some piece of their own life. Yeah, and listen, I'll, I'll, I'll happily add, Chuck, you know, I could, I could and would love to, frankly, go on for hours, but I, I definitely had the advantage of knowing you a, as a teacher and a man, and that informed my reading, but I didn't know about your childhood or, or several of the scenarios that either loosely or directly inspired a lot of the fire escape stories. But I would say among the many things that I could and, and have said about your writing in those uh, pieces, you bring a, it's very evident that you bring a lifetime of teaching and observing 
to the table. And that is the, the writing is infused with that kind of generous wisdom of, you, you, it's just very obvious that you've experienced a lot, but you've listened and absorbed a lot of stories, both in your family and throughout decades of being around people and being a good listener. So well, thank you. Yeah, and I've, I've, I have discovered exactly what you've said about my own life that way. And I want to add one more thing. Um, I've never been a big fan of the tie it up neat ending. Okay. I mean, and, and everything's got to come together in some way, mm -hmm. but sometimes I think in highly commercial writing, it goes a little too far, you know, that way. So a lot of the re re reading that I've mentioned, a lot of the reading that I've mentioned here in this conversation is stuff that is not necessarily tied together neatly. Although when you read it and think about it, you say, okay, I understand how the author got to that point. Yeah. 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 Thank you for that. Okay. I usually conflate the next two because I've found that they're kind of inseparable. So feel free to attack in any number of, of angles, but the notion of both writer's block and writing routine. Uh, I, I think we've discovered in this series, of course, there isn't one prescribed formula that works for everyone, but I'm always curious to know if the writers I'm talking to do have a routine or do they believe in them and have they experienced writer's block? And if so, how have they handled it? Yeah, I think you're right to combine those two. Um, I think writer's block is a very real thing that writers have to deal with. Um, writing routine. Let me start with that, though, because when I'm really into it, I do have a routine, you know, and it's um, usually means that I need to get out of the house and go to my favorite coffee shop or go out on a bench somewhere or whatever. Okay, and just really, you know, let everything that's been building in my head, you know, come out. Okay, because if I stay in the house, I find too many things that will I find too many reasons to just be distracted, you know? Yeah. I mean, and um, so, plus I got to give my wife a break. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now in all seriousness, I think that that's really important and that you get a routine for some people and they can write in their homes. That's, that's great. I have a hard time with that. Um, the other thing about my routine is that uh, I am a person that needs to be able to write in a condensed space. And I think that goes all the way back to the way I started to become a writer, you know, in journalism. In journalism back in the old days, you had a limited space and a limited amount of time, and you better, you better, you better hit that space and hit that time because the, you know, the editor is waiting at the Washington Post. I phoned in stories, you know, from out in the field that I actually wrote while I was on the phone with a dictate, as they used to call it, a dictationist, you know, typing as I spoke. So that stay that has stayed with me, and I will sometimes take something as simple as an actual piece of paper, and this is a very small little tablet, and see if I can fill it one page at a time. Sometimes I'll even draw it into quadrants and try to fill a quadrant, or if I'm doing it, I'm doing it on my computer. I will just take a, I'll take a like I'm writing myself an email and just let it all come out. Okay, and after I do that a few times, then I take what I've done and I put it together and then I start constructing a document. Okay, the writer's block part of it though, Sean, um, I don't know about others, I talked to other writers during this age of the pandemic, a lot of writers thought they were just gonna be able to write like crazy and have that many other things to do. And it has not worked out that way. You know, I've been very fortunate in that I'm part of a couple of different writers groups, people that I help with their work. And so I've been able to, you know, help move them along. Um, but for myself, you know, I haven't been as productive as I should be. Writer's block, but I'll overcome it. I know I will. I've got my little tablet right here. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that's another topic that we could and, and another forum should really talk at length about. But I, I, I'm fascinated by, um, you know, sometimes you, a writer, it's a luxury, but I do think a writer needs to have some semblance of, stability is probably too heavy of a word, but predictability, like if you, no matter how busy or stressed you are, but your daily routine is, there's a trajectory of your near future that you can get your mind around. I think COVID for all of us really put that on a tightrope and none of us, or I'll speak for my generation, right? 
have ever experienced. We haven't been through a major war on our soil. So I, I don't know if we were equipped, not only as artists, but as human beings to deal with writing is a luxury to us. I mean, you have to make it a necessity, right? And I, you mentioned like when you're in a good group, yeah. I think we can all relate to, um, you know, I've written certain things where I've never been busier and I somehow had the energy and time. And that's a fascinating side topic, like how that works. But I'm, I'm with you. And I have also talked to a lot of people, Chuck, uh, and, 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 and at all levels, you know, New York Times bestseller, novice writers and everything in between that have said they were surprised and disappointed by how little productivity they had. But I, I think as we start to get some distance, it kind of makes sense because I just think we were all yeah. in a weird headspace. Yes, you're absolutely right. It's a great analysis of, of where we are and you know why that writer's block sort of loomed out there at a time when a lot of writers thought they were just going to be most productive. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's a moral in that story, but I, I think the the key the key one is you know, as again, as we talked about at the outset, the notion of we are kind of slowly, steadily coming out of this. And that that's great for any number of reasons. But I do think we're going to have a kind of renaissance, a lot of built up, pent up creativity that's going to explode across all art forms, which is really exciting. I do, too. I agree with you. Very exciting. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. The roaring 20s, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Here we come. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. How about uh, on a change of pace, a significant setback? artistic or otherwise that that either it could be recent or when you look back over years you know you realize now maybe actually put you on a different trajectory than you imagined well uh for people of my age and era um i think I, I have a lot of people that will understand exactly what i'm about to say and that was the year 1968 it was a year that i graduated college it was the year that um the vietnam war was at its peak it was the year that deferments for college, uh, graduate school, were eliminated. Okay, so for people like me, okay, who had graduated and I was ready to go to graduate school full time, out at uh, in Indiana, um, I had gotten a role there as a teaching assistant in their uh, graduate program for communications and public affairs, mm -hmm. and it was all <clears throat> it was all taken away, okay? So, you know, without going into a lot about the war, because, <clears throat> excuse me, I am, I am really not a person who was like a anti-war. I was a pro-soldier, the guys who fought for us. Yeah. I didn't wind up being one of those soldiers because I wound up going into teaching and they gave me a deferment for teaching, not at the graduate level, but at the elementary school level, which still to this day doesn't really make any sense. Okay, so that was a setback in this way, Sean. I had certain things that I was planning on achieving that included writing, it included marketing, it included <clears throat> working in, with my cousin in the music industry that I was unable to do. On the other hand, out of that quote unquote setback, I became a teacher and the wonders of teaching, you know, that, that I experienced over the years influenced my life so greatly that I can't imagine <clears throat> that had I been able to follow what I had intended to do in 1968, that I would have been any happier than I am today. It was wonderful. So, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but when I have to look at a particular time, that was it. Yeah. And, and I will, I will add uh, again, for those that are not yet sufficiently enticed, uh, Chuck does deal directly and indirectly with that momentous year and uh, how that impacted society on a lot of levels uh, in that trilogy. So check that out. Um, all right, so this is a similar question, but, and, and you know, this is great. Cause again, I, I feel like I know knowing you, but I wouldn't be able to really say this how would you say you've developed your career? And I think with you, again, that, that could apply. I mean, I, I guess I would say looking back now as, at a career that's still going, because you're kind of a Renaissance man, but in, in, you know, two minutes or less, like how would you define this trajectory, teaching, writing, et cetera? The, um, the career really began in high school for me. I'll never forget it, okay? I was a junior, I think, 
junior in high school. My best friend and I were in a journalism class. A young man came in, adult man, came in and said, look, I'm going to be opening up a newspaper here in Vienna, Virginia. I need a couple of people to help me out. Anybody interested? My best friend and I said, sure. So we went to work for this guy and he turned over the whole, basically everything from writing to editing, to laying out the paper, to delivering it. My buddy and I did the <laughs> weekly. Okay. We got paid minimal, but he turned over the keys to the, to the office to us. We could go in anytime we wanted, which sometimes was a little, um, there were some parties there. <laughs> but you know what, Sean, that made me realize, hey, I can do this. I can write, I can edit, I can do all this. And from there, you know, it led to um, something that I did throughout college. And then, you know, after 1968 and graduating and so forth and going on for my master's at American U and teaching there, you know, I started writing as a freelancer for the Washington Post and so forth and so on. So that's how the career developed, but it really started, really started at the ground level in high school. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, and listen, I mean, I'll, I'll indulge briefly, but, but I think necessarily to point out that uh, for you younger folks, you just really have no idea. Like when I was on this uh, paper staff with Chuck, I would say that it was more similar in 1988 to how it was in 1888 than it is between then and now, no just question. because of computers, we literally cut and pasted and people are like, what does that mean? You know, click yeah. and no, no, we had razors, <laughs> we cut and pasted, but boy, the lessons, uh, you know, I don't look at that as there's a lot of nostalgia and lessons learned, but what that taught about the craft and respecting the space, um, having a hands-on experience was, was absolutely critical before I think anyone even knew they wanted to write because it just teaches you the rules. Yes, great point. Yeah, it teaches you the rules. And I was fortunate to learn them, but, you know, in this very early experience, you know, from the ground level, man, and working and actually getting paid for it, you know, but I, we learned everything. We learned everything from running the addressograph machine. There's something that people can look up. <laughs> <laughs> so laying out the paper and writing the stories. Yeah. And um, even when I was doing a lot of freelancing at the Post, you know, I met a lot of wonderful people there, made friends with a lot of great reporters that were there full time. But some of them were envious of me as a freelancer because they were like, Chuck, you can pitch to any part of the paper you want. Your, your name appears everywhere. You know, you're in style, you're in the sports, you're in here. And, you know, it was, it, I was just really fortunate that way. And, you know, there were other publications as well, but the, those years of, you know, of um, being a freelancer where the various editors at the Post, I could go to them and sit in their office or call them up on the phone and pitch a story it was wonderful. And listen, I, I, I'd be remiss to not just jump on that again for, for maybe the younger folks, especially that are watching this, uh, being versatile uh, and, and being opportunistic as the, as the industry consolidates, being able to write uh, professionally from any number of, of different angles and directions is, is an absolutely critical part of, of getting your name out there. So Chuck, that's kind of, to me, is like a full circle of, you know, obviously the industry has changed a lot, but I think that's something that's as important now as it was in your time, being able to kind yes. of have, being nimble enough to, and be curious enough to be able, I, I think some people aren't equipped to bounce around from discipline to discipline. Um, so something to emulate, I think. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I strongly urge people to try it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh <clears throat> Chuck, define or explain what literary success, literary success means to you. Um, literary success to me is at two different levels. One is to me as the writer, finally getting it out there and feeling good about getting it out there. Okay. You know, the tendency is for writers to just keep writing. Nobody wants to release a lot of times. They don't. You know, and I remember a, I took a trip down to Key West and visited Ernest Hemingway's home down there uh, because I, I, I was writing a story about his best friend and the exec, executor of his estate, uh, Toby Bruce. So Toby met me at the airport, took me to the Hemingway house and took me on a personal tour of it. And he showed me where Hemingway wrote The Old Man in the Sea, table by table by table. And, 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 and he told me, he said, you know what? If it wasn't for his agent, whose name I'm forgetting now, do you remember? The famous one, right? Yeah, yeah. 
I can't think of it either, but I know his editor and his agent were. Yeah, so he said if it wasn't for his agent, you know, Papa, as he called him, would have, would just be sitting here still writing, you know, until he passed out. He would never have released anything. Wow. You had to, you know, you had to finally, you have to finally call a stop to it. So number one, success to me means feeling comfortable enough to say, okay, this is it. Okay, I'm, I could probably keep writing on it forever, but this is it. Okay, and getting it out there. Number two is success on the other side of it means impact. Okay, when I read something, even by unknown authors, that has an impact or a poem that makes an impact on me, you know, I just love it. To me, that's success. And I can't tell you how many times I've read stuff where I wish I could get in touch with the writer, you know, whether it's a poem or a story or a, or a singer, and just say, you know what, I love that song, or I love that poem, or I love that writing. Impact is, is the most important thing. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. I mean, I, I certainly agree. And, and I think, you know, again, this series and, and the more people I talk to, I'm, I'm finding um, it's kind of an antidote for cynicism and egotism that, boy, are there very few, and probably has always been thus, very few writers who are achieving their dreams or illusions. Um, and and I've, I've been really heartened by the number of writers that, that echo what you and I would both say, which is, if you're not feeling it yourself, what are you doing it for? And, and having an impact or it leading to a conversation, a meaningful kind of uh, epiphany for someone else is worth its weight in gold. Um, there's just nothing that can approximate that. Yeah. And, and I think if you're not doing that, and listen, I think you bring up a point, I'll, I'll just throw in, uh, for, again, for those of you watching, a good practice. I've read writers suggest this. I'm happy to throw my name in the hat and suggest it. When I read a great poem or a story, and, and these days at least, it's easier. Most yes. people have a website. I am in the habit, um, without any expectation of ROI or even correspondence, um, of going to that contact page and just saying, I just read, you know, XYZ and it blew me away. Thank you. And yeah. sometimes a conversation and is beautiful, it's organic, but without any expectation, but just to let the writer know. Um, so I'm saying this to those of you that are that are that are uh, readers. It means a lot to a writer to get an email like that. Um, in, in fact, again, it, it means a lot more than knowing they sold a book, knowing someone read it and, and it meant enough that they reached out and, and said something. And uh, Chuck, again, I know just from just from seeing it in action that you are uh, one of the rare writers that has you, you compel readers to reach out and thank you. And I'm one of them. So that's uh, that's a, a, a literary life well lived, my friend. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. You figured okay. it out. Yep. All right. Final, final question. And I think your whole, because of your, your teacherly vibe, this has all been instructional, but brass tacks, a one or two minute exhortation for a younger or less experienced writer looking for some advice. What would you tell them? Um, I would tell them, go for, go for broke, go for it, run with it. You have an idea, you know, Put, get it down on paper and get it into your computer, okay? Um, remember that th your goal, number one, as I said earlier, is for you to recognize that your writing means something to you, okay? And so therefore run with it. And then don't be afraid to get it out there at some point. I know it's scary, you know, to, to every writer that I talk to and writers that I work with, but, you know, try to get it out there because the likelihood is if you've really worked on it hard, it will have an impact on others. And we all need that kind of impact. We need to hear other experiences and think about things in different, you know, broader ways. So my, my biggest advice, you know, to, to, um, to writers always is write for yourself but with the understanding that you're eventually going to do something with it, you're going to get it out there. Sometimes it might only be, you know, you want to do these family type memoir type things. Wonderful. But you want to do that. You want to get it out there because then you're making an impact on that group of people. You know, so that that would be my big piece of advice. I mean, I, I think that's a that's a good mic drop, uh, you know, <laughs> source of inspiration. Um, but Chuck, I, I, so I, I, I've fortunately had the opportunity to tell you in person, but I'll, I'll put it on the permanent record. Um, the, the, the things aside from, and, I, and I, I could, again, 
talk for hours about your impact on me as a, as a teacher uh, and, and meeting you at the right time in my life. But I think the two things I really admire most about you is you have, I think, a very rare combination of, of absolute joy and passion of the arts, but a real appreciation for the discipline. And mm -hmm. so, again, of course, that conveys in your own writing. But I think you had this one-two punch of you, you can get people fired up about it, but you're not going to let them do it badly. And, and your, your impact, your insistence on quality and respect for the form is something that was very important to me. So in my own humble and modest way, I'd say anyone that's paying attention to what I do in this series and this uh, a not inconsiderable chunk of influence and positive inspiration comes from this man. So on a lot of levels, it's a real honor to have you here talking to you, Chuck. And um, COVID schmovid, no more excuses. <laughs> Anna Karenina, and uh, when's the next when's the next project coming out? All right, yes, sir. I will get to Anna Karenina, and I will keep you posted on the next project because I know that you are now the teacher. <laughs> I'm gonna fake. I'm gonna fake it like with everything else. I'm gonna fake it till I make it. <laughs> and listen, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I want to thank you for all of the wonderful, very kind things that you said, and uh, letting me know that I had some sort of positive impact on you. But I also want you to know that I am extremely proud of all of the work that you've done and the you know the big step that you took in establishing 1455 and uh, how it's um, how it's been how it's been changing lives for people it's really wonderful Sean and I wish you all the best and of course I'll help you in any way that I can I mean that's that's literally more than I could ask for but yeah coming from you again that, that means a lot and you know I think any anyone that was a student can attest that the teachers that meant the most to you, you never want to stop impressing them. So it's never superficial, but you always want to get the kudos from the teachers that you admired. So that still tickles me and uh, really makes me happy, Chuck. So thank you for that a lot. Well, keep it up, Sean. Thanks very much. All right, partner. We'll talk to you soon. But Chuck, uh, like I said, and again, folks, check out, you'll see it in the write-up. I'm going to put a link to his website, a link to the Amazon. Check out his books. Chuck Cascio, the man, the myth, the legend. Um, be well, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Sean. Take care. All right. Bye.